Hello and welcome to the London School of Economics and Political Science, hereafter referred to as the LSC, for this online event, which is part of this year's LSC Festival, Shaping the Post-COVID World. Free and open to the public, our week-long roster of virtual events, ending March 6th, addresses the direction our world could and should be taking after COVID-19 and how social science research can help shape it. My name is Rob Telnije Paley. I am assistant professor in the Department of Social Policy here at the LSC and will serve as your chair for this special event on the colonial legacies of global public health. Now, before we delve into our discussion, I'd like to acknowledge that this year's festival is adapting to what we might call a new normal with all events held online and streamed via Zoom and the Festival Hub, the online home of the LSE Festival. We encourage you to visit the Festival Hub to access all festival content, including our series of live events via Zoom and a series of pre-recorded 10-minute talks with LSE faculty called Festival Shorts. The full program can be found at lse.ac.uk backslash festival. For our discussion today, you may be wondering what exactly is the current state of global health scholarship, policy and practice? How does global health as a profession and as an academic discipline perpetuate structural and epistemic violence? How do power asymmetries between the so-called global north and south reproduce global health inequalities? And last but certainly not least, how do we disrupt global health's inherent coloniality? I am super pleased to be joined by a rock star panel of scholar practitioners who will tackle these important questions head on. And to commemorate how truly global this conversation is, our guests are zooming in from three different continents, three different countries, three different time zones. Now, Sumega Ashtana is a physician, health administrator, and a health policy and systems researcher. An advocate for decolonizing global health, she teaches global health policy and governance at Queen Mary University of London as an honorary lecturer. Sumega is also the country lead of the India chapter of a global social movement called Women in Global Health, which aims to achieve gender equality in global health leadership. Welcome Sumega, joining us from Delhi. Mosoka P. Fala is the founder and executive director of Refuge Place International, an NGO in Liberia addressing access to affordable quality health care for poor urban as well as rural dwellers. Mosoka was the recent past director general of the National Public Health Institute of Liberia, which he co-founded in 2017. He also helped establish the first Masters of Public Health program in the University of Liberia's College of Health Sciences, previously serving as chairman of the Department of Biochemistry. He was named one of Time Magazine's Persons of the Year in 2014 for his Ebola relief efforts in Liberia. Welcome, Osuka, joining us from Freetown. Last but certainly not least, Paul Farmer is professor and chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has written extensively on health, human rights, and the consequences of social inequality. And his most recent book, which I have here hot off the press, is entitled Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, Ebola and the Ravages of History. Paul is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and has been awarded numerous honors, including the Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association and the Outstanding International Physician Award from the American Medical Association. Welcome Paul, who is joining us from Miami. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is LSE Festival. This online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. We've got a series of provocations that I will ask our panel with each round of provocations followed by questions from you, the audience. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and I will pose as many questions as possible to the panel. 
please let us know your name and affiliation if you feel so um, honored to do so. We are also particularly keen to hear from our students, our alumni, as well as incoming students. Now we actually want to stimulate your thinking early on by posing this audience poll question. Are you ready? Do you think colonialism has been a significant factor in how COVID-19 has impacted health systems in the so-called global South? Yes, no, or I don't know. Now let's enter our first round of provocations followed by a quick Q&A. Many scholars and activists have demonstrated that global health is built on colonial logics in which histories of slavery, material extraction, and institutional racism continue to underpin the design of global health programs. How can people working in and outside of the sector begin to address these forms of structural violence? Sumega, Paul, and Mosoka. Let's start with Sumega. What are your insights on this provocation? Thank you, Rob. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you all for joining. It's such a privilege to be here and share my thoughts. Right, so, so global health has a colonial legacy is now like pretty well known and we are all pretty aware about this. Um, not going, improving what it is, but let's talk about, you know, how do we move from here? I particularly liked your question when you said those in and outside the sector. So in, in my view, health sector is much broader than, you know, what, what we understand in terms of health services and so on. So while we talk about sector, I think it just includes everything. So I'll just hint my question for everyone at different levels, be it of what we understand inside the health sector or outside the health sector, including nutrition, including agriculture, transport and everything, and of what we under, understand as social determinants now and so on. But I'll start with that the first step I feel to address this is to be aware, to, to just acknowledge and recognize that this exists. This exists and this exists in what all different forms and the way it has captured our imagination and, and our thoughts. Even, even our critical thoughts have been captured by colonialism. You know, We've got even our lens from there. So having that kind of awareness and the different manifestations of coloniality in global health, the next step I feel is to you know, reflect and that constant reflexivity in global health to, to, to acknowledge our own position, our own positionalities, as well as our own position in global health. What role do we play? Where, where are we as actors in global health? Are we just at the receiving end or, we do, or do we have a better agency than just being at the receiving end? And whatever that agency is, exercise that agency to bring in a change, to bring in a change which is more equal in its approach which believes in an equal partnership. Now, these are easy terms to say, but you know, these are so complex to understand what we mean by equal, equal partnerships, equal collaborations, and so on with the communities or the people who are affected by it. So I'll say let's, you know, let's go towards building a more equal world where everyone has an equal say in, in the policies which are affected them, affecting them. And while you know, sometimes when we try and initiate efforts to do good in global health or work for the marginalized populations or, or the vulnerable people and so on, we often mistake to kind of take their space or, or talk on their behalf, you know, and we always say, oh, we're, we're being the voice of the migrants. We want to be the voice of so-and-so. So what I want to say is that please don't be their voice. Create create a platform, create an environment where they can express themselves, where their voice is heard, where their voices are valued and as valued as someone who's coming from a very top-notch supranational institution to come and tell them this is good for you. Now, just to give you a small example, in the COVID times in India, we were hearing you know, the impact of COVID uh, uh, on people largely and, and all the TV shows, the newspaper articles, everywhere we were seeing 
men coming and talking and and to be more correct male surgeons in white coats in their aprons coming and talking about the impact of covid and women were only talked about as you know being impacted by the covid and no contributions there on uh, how the frontline health workers are are playing a part people were just sympathetic towards them or or uh, you know or applauding their efforts that they're doing this great work no one gave them a channel to come forward and talk about their own issues and their contributions themselves so what we did with women in global health india was to create a channel where they could come themselves thanks to the digital world we could hear from them while they were in the remotest areas uh, in india and actually hear from them first hand than through journalist or through you know any kind of proxy um, mediums which claim to represent their voices so i feel while we approach you know these structural violence bits let let us hear from the people themselves it does not recreate uh recreate the inequalities that we have been victim of now that we are the channel of change let's let's bring a transformative change which is more equal i'll just take a pause there Thank you so much for your insights, Omega. As you were talking, I kept thinking about Arundhati's dictum, um, Arundhati Roy's statement that there's no such thing as the voiceless. There's only the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard, right? So this idea of equality of participation, equality of voices is so, so key to this conversation on global health inequalities. Thank you. Now, Paul, you use structural violence as a framework for pretty much everything that you've written that I've read. Um, and, you know, for the people sitting at home who are not really sure what this means, it's a term that was coined by Johan Gautang, who's considered to be the father of um, peace studies. And he said that structural violence is basically the rules, the norms, the regulations that fuel inequality and, and, and injustice. So Paul, please come in here and, and tell us, what are your thoughts about this? How can people in and outside of the sector address these forms of structural violence? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rob Tell. And I, I'm just going to start by echoing Sumega because, you know, I think that we, we make a mistake if we trivialize the awareness part, just acknowledgement and awareness. And the Arundhati Roy um, reminder uh, is one that would spur me just to add something to what Sumega said. And I imagine Masaka too, we've, we've uh, you know, we agree on, on some of these things. So I just want to point to one of those blind spots that is so striking to me in the course of, you know, working in the clinical desert or whatever, which is a, po a post-colonial desert, of course, or a, a neo-colonial desert. And that is that uh, often we, the, the preferentially unheard uh, are, are remarkably eloquent uh, regarding their needs and their aspirations, which in my experience are not that different from my own. Right, my own needs and aspirations, you know, and and some of those are, you know, so uh, basely material that it, it it behooves us when we when we're thinking about epistemology and awareness to remember the material demands. That that of course would square with all demands for reparation after an extractive and hurtful uh, uh, process. And now, just to give one example uh, about blind spots, what what has struck me mo most as a practitioner, a clinician, is the, uh, is the tendency to ignore these appeals for material assistance uh, to the sick and injured, the uh, unhoused, the displaced, the dispossessed. And instead, the usual class-based takeover inside a setting of the terms of the uh, discussion. You know, in other words, the preferentially unheard or the silence. Um, so it leads you to interesting things like to talk about a control over care paradigm as typical of all of colonial rule really from the late 19th century through the 20th uh, is, is again something if we don't talk about that then we're missing those voices again who said look you know for us being uh, told we mustn't be breeding grounds for epidemic disease is not the same thing as saying we're here to care for you in the event that you're ill or injured. And that control of repair, a care paradigm has seeped into modern uh, public health, um, which, where it probably was originally, uh, you know, in places like LSE or, or, or Liverpool, other places where uh, 
colonial global health began. So I'm very worried when I don't hear people in our progressive circles talking about safety nets, medical care, staff stuff, space systems, referral hospitals, et cetera. And I, I think we, we, should, we should stick with that. You know, we should not forget in the course of our efforts to upend the epistemological damage done that there was great material damage done as well. Why is it after the British were in Sierra Leone, since Mosaka's in Freetown right now, you know, that since the late 18th century, not the late 19th century, like much of Africa, and between that time and when they left or formally left in the 60s, 1960s, they founded not only not a single medical school, but no nursing schools either. And, and you know, and I think that's a, a reminder <clears throat> of the impossibility of delivering uh, of delivering on the promise of medicine and public health without the staff stuff space and systems. So I hope in our movement we'll keep pushing forward real material change as is insisted by those left preferentially unheard. Thank you so much, Paul, for your interjections. Um, staff stuff in space is something that's a mantra for your work throughout all of the readings that I've done. Um, really important, and, and, and you're highlighting the fact that this extraction is certainly not by coincidence, it's by design. And how do we continue to perpetuate these forms of material extraction without necessarily thinking about reparations or how do you give back and make amends and atonement? We'll come back to the care over um, the, the care over the control over care paradigm a little bit later, but thank you for bringing that up. Mosoka, your thoughts, please. Thank you very much. Uh, as I listen and reflect on Jamaica and Paul, I sort of decided to, to zero in some of the practical issues of this supremacy, this this mindset that uh, there is an asymmetric of knowledge and ability and talent in the global south. Now, you don't like me to use that word. And I will be practical. One of the examples is, for example, we collaborate with some of the Western scientists. For me, during Ebola, my first experience was someone sat and wrote an entire article, a manuscript, and sent it to me so I could sign my name as a co-author. And I said, do not insult me. I went to school like you. I went to school in the US. How do we write a paper and you don't let us sit Think about the paper and then read it out. You send me the paper and I put my name as a co author. First thing you, you, you don't think I have the ability to think. You're not transferring technology I and mean, knowledge and skill set. And you want, and so they do that all the time with papers. Papers are written and somehow could put their names on those people and don't realize it's an insult of their intellectual ability. It's an insult. Of, it it real their process to develop science in Africa. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to speak about is the issue of grants. Most of the time, we apply for grant in the South. Right now, I'm struggling. I have demonstrated a model that sort of uh, reduces or eliminates maternal mortality. I want to go for a grant from the UK, but I will never get that grant until I have a UK recession. Why? Why can't you trust the African or those in the global South with the funds to do the research if they demonstrate that they can do it? But it must be tied with somebody from the global North. And at the end of the day, if you take into consideration travels and conference and indirect costs, 80% of the phone goes to the north and not in a very little come to the south. The third piece I want to speak about is this is my own practical experience is pathogen sample sharing. Because I know this and I was involved in the take of the discussion during the Ebola outbreak in Liberia. Some group took the pathogen as some of our specimen in the middle of the night and took it down to the north. Then we came to discuss on the pathogens that we need to move the specimen because it contains knowledge that will benefit science. There were advocates that were saying that every one of our 10,000 or more samples should be destroyed. They had a team that was waiting in Senegal to come in country and use bleach. And I said, no, we have this, this specimen that will benefit science and benefit our country, benefit the development of manpower and education. I would agree. And so there was a big fight between us until we came to the compromise, then we had some friends within the NIH who saw the need that no, we should get the samples, keep them, and they should be the owner, they should be on the ownership of Liberia. We should benefit Liberia by providing education, higher education for Liberians, collaboration for research, and to share the benefits. Fast forward, one of the top universities came up to me and said, uh, during the 2018-2019 Ebola outbreak in the DRC, they had developed a diagnostic kit that could use oral rapid diagnostic case to determine Ebola. They wanted the specimen to test. I said, very good idea. Let's say that it's the term and condition. 
They said, well, we'll give you $30,000 and we'll give you the first 10 samples, the first 1,000 samples. Afterwards, you have to buy it from us. And I told them, no. I said, we have, we have to have a part in the RP. There has to be a percentage in the RP because I already got the information. They are, they are, set, they are sent for licensure for the US FDA and the European EMA. They wanted to just use us to validate the, the, the diagnostic test and then move ahead and make millions. And I said to them, it's not possible. There has to be a percentage for Liberia because the Liberian's blood is in this. Even if I'm no more around, our children and grandchildren can benefit. This increase the offer to 60,000. I said, no, we're not going to do it. A long last, they came back and said, we found a willing partner. We are going to walk away. These are the kind of things that happen here with this supremacy and we don't benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And, and, and most importantly, thank you for standing up <laughs> because I think that doesn't happen um, significantly enough. This whole idea of global, the so-called global North supremacy, which is steeped in you know thinking around racist and white supremacist ideas about the so-called global South not having the capacity in quotation marks to actually take on research funding, to actually be able to you know, author an article that can be published in a high impact journal. Um, so thank you so much for your insights, um, Musoka, Paul, and, and, and Sumega to start us off. Now, I think that we've got the poll results ready. Um, and, I, and I think we're gonna see, okay, so interesting. Do you think colonialism has been a significant factor in how COVID-19 has impacted health systems in the so-called global North? 87% say yes, and a small 1% said no. We've got I don't knows at 11%. So it seems as if, thank you very much for pulling that up. It seems as if Mosoka, Paul, and Sumega have definitely started the process of indoctrination <laughs> to, to de demonstrate how colonial logics are really underpinned by how global health infrastructure, scholarship, policy, and practice um, pervades you know, our everyday lives. So thank you for those who participated in the poll. Now I wanna shift in and start with the first question from our audience, if you beg my indulgence. Um, the first question is from Beauty Lam Lamani. And Beauty says, is it possible to create a meaningful decolonization movement at all levels, individually, collectively, institu institutionally, and structurally? Um, perhaps if it's okay, maybe I can come to Samega to, to start us on um, responding to that. So is the question if it is possible? Yes, it's possible. And, and, and we're already doing this. We are in it. We're discussing it. This is the process that we're in. But what I would just want to highlight is that it's not a fight against someone or one country or one, you know, global south, north kind of dichotomy. It's a fight against a way of thinking. It's not that decolonizing only is happening. They're doing it to us. We're doing it to someone else. And then that someone else is doing it to someone else. So it's just about the unequal power relations in the society, which we all are a part of. Somewhere we are victims somewhere we are actually the oppressors. So the action will also residently coming from us and all of us, all, everyone around us. We are in it, uh, we've started the moment. I see a lot of decolonizing moment in most of the universities and schools and you know, so much of talks, I was just sharing it with your team earlier. This is the second or third decolonizing global health talk that I'm, I am on today. But probably not much is changing, also because change is difficult and is resistant. It takes time. And I'll go back to my previous point to say that let's create more awareness. And we necessarily do not have to create this awareness outside in the world. We have to make ourselves more aware, acknowledge our own privilege and the change that we can bring as an individual in our organizations in our immediate families, the way we treat you know, our domestic helps, the way we treat our children, the way we treat our animals, our pets. So it's, it's everywhere. Uh, this whole mindset of treating others are not equal and exploiting them for your own benefit, uh, that's where we should be looking at. I'm not sure if I answered the question correctly, but it's a simple yes. 
yes, it's possible. It's on. We just have to be more aggressive about that change. Oh. Yeah, I think you more than answered the question, um, Samega. Absolutely. So, you know, the decolonization as a process and not an event, decolonization as a lifestyle, right? A lifestyle change. And the fact that we're in it to win it. I think that's that's pretty much the summary of this, right? Um, I'm gonna move on to the second provocations if, it, if it's all right with you. And I think I would like to start us off with Paul um, giving his, his, his feedback and his interjection, or sorry, Mosoka giving his feedback and his interjections. So how have you seen the coloniality of global health manifest in your work as public health scholars and practitioners, and particularly Musoka, because you read, you wear three hats. You worked as a policymaker in the sphere, in the space. You've also worked as a scholar and as a practitioner. So maybe you can start us off. How do you have you seen the coloniality of global health manifest in your work as a public health scholar, practitioner, and policymaker? Mosoka, do you want to start us off? Okay, I think there might be a bit of technical difficulty on Mosoka's um, end. So, Paul. Well, basically, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mosoka. Go ahead. Okay. He's, he's uh, passed on the baton to you, Paul, so you can start and we'll come back to Musaka in a, in a few seconds. Can, can you, re, can you re, re, repeat the question? Sure, so the question is, how have you seen the coloniality of global health manifest in your work as a public health scholar and practitioner? Well, I mean, uh, a lot of blind spots, you know, when, when we think about, to use your formulation, Rob Tell, scholarship, uh, pr practice, uh, what was the third thing? Policy. Policy. You know, uh, well, our practice is deplorable, our policies aren't much better, and our scholarship tends to reflect uh, neo-colonial and colonial uh, perspectives and paradigms, as Sumega just said. So. Uh, but there's hope there. That's why we're still involved with the universities. We believe, you know, and, and I can't just but say cheer of what Sumega uh, just said about the yes, the, the, we have to do this. We, it's a process. We're, we're in the middle of it. Um, but I have never failed to see coloniality in the work that we do. It's, it's always there. You know, it had to be the answer to the question you posed in the poll because we live in a post-colonial world, therefore we know that colonial rule has shaped our experience or the experience of others related to us. Um, and, and I've seen it everywhere. And I think those who are attuned to history see it everywhere. And, and, and uh, the question is, when can we see it undone? How, how, when will we recognize that we're making a contribution, as Sumega said, to a process, a lifestyle even? That's the best use of the word lifestyle I've heard in a while, Rob Tell. And, you know, sometimes it's surprising things. I'll just bring one up. If there is a control over care paradigm, and if it is rooted in colonial rule, particularly its expansion in West Africa at the time of a number of revolutionary new tools in public health, like vaccines, if that's true, then when will we recognize blows against control over care? And I, I, I just would invite us to go back and reflect on what did public health and development experts in universities and public health bureaucracies say about AIDS treatment across the continent of Africa for years after the development of effective suppressive therapy. What did they say? That's a question about scholarship, policy, and practice, assuming that their voices had some impact in the field, which they did. And, you know, again, they were counseling control over care. It's like antiretrovirals are not for Africa. You, you know, they don't have watches, they don't have cold chain. And you're gonna see the, hear the same things when we're talking about a new deliverable like a COVID vaccine. So I think it's everywhere. I think with Sumega, we have to give it a resounding yes, we can, you know, as a response to that question and look very critically at things we might miss. For example, I'm not sure a lot of people thought that George W. Bush would push forward an anti-control over care paradigm uh, 
you know, intervention uh, at a time when it was needed. It's not where I thought the the, the most likely, uh, you know, support would come from. Uh, but if it did strike a blow against control over care, then I'm, I would say, hey, that's a, that's a marker of an anti-colonial move, regardless of its origin. And uh, I think we should look for more of that and pr promote more uh, attention again to not to, you know, why is policy bad? It's because policymakers either have some vested interest or they're too far away from the, they don't have proximity to the real problems. And of course, uh, you know, in structural violence paradigms, you'd point to the former more than the latter, but regardless of motivations, we can tell when the policies are not serving the needs of the, of the people we wish to serve. Yeah, thank you so much for those insights, um, Paul. Clearly, there's a trifecta, right? The, the scholarship, the policy, and the practice all need to be worked on simultaneously in order to really lift us out of these malaise that we find ourselves in the global health um, global health sector. So, Musaka, can we come back to you? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, sorry, my internet connectivity. Uh, like I said, uh, in the midst of the Ebola, Realize that uh, one of the, the creation of, of problems, and so we realize that although there was so much associated with infectious disease outbreak, and now we've taken a step further to look at to zero in on poverty and look at industrialization. And what we've seen across most of our large uh, concessions and plantations. So it looks like we're still having a actually to not have the privileges. So one of these uh, uh, contractor died and his wife got Ebola and died. The company did not allow themselves to pick the body. So the people stay in the house until every one of them died except one person because they had to protect their plantation and those outside of their plantations, though they were providing labor for them, but they could not help them. And so I took a step back and decided to visit all of the large plantations in the context of Lassa fever. Whether I went to LAC or I went to the other companies, it, the, the divide was clear for that. These people were being exploited, but there was nothing in agency provided for them to be protected against infectious diseases. And so the vulnerability of these people increases in the event of Ebola or COVID-19. The interest of this big industry is not the welfare of the ordinary product provide the cheap labor, but is to exploit them and maximize the profit. And then there's a vicious cycle of poverty. And clearly we've established that poverty serves as a magnet for attracting these infectious diseases and amplifying them. Because it's more really like the agency, there's so much structural violence that they don't have the agency to come out. And so one of the things we clearly have shown, and we're trying to publish this commentary and saying that industrialization sort of indirectly, directly or indirectly, promote vulnerability to infectious diseases. Because you see the clear divide in the concession era versus the non-concession era. These will provide labor, but they are in extreme poverty and they are much more vulnerable. Come forward to COVID-19, we are seeing the very thing. I go to control for, for COVID-19. There was a case I left from I infected, but no agency. So we clearly see this, that in the post-colonialism view, of this extractive industry continue to uh, dispower these people, increase their poverty and make them very vulnerable to infectious diseases and pandemic and epidemics. Thank you so much for your intervention. So this whole idea of industrialization fueling global health um, inequalities and also particular vulnerabilities among citizens. And it seems to me as if, you know, cause I've worn the policymaker hat as you have Musuka. It seems to me as if the state has a primary responsibility in terms of its regulatory function. And when it doesn't play that regulatory function that's when you see these sort of inequalities and, and vulnerabilities come to the fore. Sumega, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this? I just want to bring in a very different direction to this discussion. Uh, when I saw the question around, you know, how has it impacted coloniality has impacted my public health and global health work. I just took a moment to think how and I, and I just felt I'm a walking case study of biases in global health. Global health certainly belongs to men 
and with no offense to the white men sitting in the north. First bias towards me of, you know, I'm a woman, certainly less equal than men. I'm a woman studying global health in India. No, no. I'm a woman who is trained in alternate medicine and not the so-called Western modern evidence-based medicine, clearly not equal. All my training has been in India, so I know nothing. I want to work in India and I don't have other ambitions. Clearly, you know nothing, you only know India, no matter how much you know. Now, having said that, when I started my doctoral work, looking at the role of global actors in health systems strengthening in India, I couldn't find a single framework, single scholarship from India looking at the role of these global actors. Ultimately, I was using the frameworks which were produced by them to critically look at them. I, I don't have scholars in India who I can reach out to say, hey, I'm looking at this, can you guide me? And all people that I go back to are based in certain of those institutions or even those organizations, you know, it's a revolving door there in the global organizations. It's really unfortunate. It has impacted all my public health, my global health journey. When I even speak to students, I'm sure they'll have their own biases of someone coming from India and telling us in UK about global health. These are so inherent, these judgments, these biases are so inherent. I face them day in, day out. Even in my own country, when I talk about my own country's context, having spent my life studying there, working there and so on, I'm not valued as much. And I've written widely about it. I've spoken widely about it that I'm not, and no offense again, that someone coming from Harvard on a, you know, visiting this thing and talking about Indian health systems is clearly more valued than me. This is how coloniality has impacted my public health and my global health journey. Now, how do we move from here? And it's not just, it's not just pointed to one person or one institution again. It's, it's, it's a complex structure where so many people are involved. You know? it's, it's primarily my own government, which should have invested in making the education institutions in my own country to that level where you know we could compete and we could have. And even when we have done that, I'm very proud of coming from, you know, of, of, of being trained by the best of the people around and so on. So those are things we need to look at when we talk about coloniality, something that's not happening in the air in the supranational spheres, but something which is actually happening to every practitioner of public health and global health. Over. Thank you so much, Sumega. As you were talking, I was thinking about Audre Lorde's statement about the fact, can, can we use the master's tools to dismantle systems of oppression? And that's something that I think we all struggle with on this panel as well. Um, thank you for also teasing out the gender dimensions of global health inequalities. There was a report I think done by 5050 about how global health tends to be predominantly um, disproportionately um, represented at the very higher echelons by, by white men. So it's a reality that we all have to face and a reality that we all have to, to struggle with and deal with. Um, we've got a question that's come in from Vina Diwan. And Vina Diwan says, are there responsibilities for countries, universities, and researchers in countries that were colonized to address the effects of colonialism in global health? Is it okay if I come to you, Mosaka, on that question? Are there responsibilities for countries, yeah, yeah. universities and researchers from countries that have been colonized? Yeah. yeah, it is our responsibility and we try to provide scholarship. Uh, but sometimes when you push advocacy to change the system, uh, to change the system, you become a victim. I can tell you how I have been fought at all level with some of the big organizations so you, you have the university that stand to create this scholarship, the advocacy based on research and try to inform politics, I mean, policies. But you will realize that even within our political dimension, you still have the influence of the coloniality, of coloniality. the influence of our politicians. And, and, and if you come as a scholar, very soon you become the lone voice. And you know the lone 
with all the guests who are women eating up. And so they have so much power in the political arm that influence the policy. So yes, we have institutions. We do this scholarly work. We have the evidences to example show the association between industrialization and poverty and vulnerability to infectious diseases. And you bring these reports and, and, and this reform in policy. These masters with all of their large funding and huge questions are able to influence the political decisions. Either the policy are ignored, you are persecuted, or it gets killed, so they have so much power, and the power comes from the economic wealth, the economy to influence. So yes, we have institutions that create this, but most of the time, they are lone voices. Go all around Africa, look at institutions, look at the most vocal person that try to correct this colonial legacy, and they are sometimes victimized, they are isolated. So that's the challenge we face. Yeah, um, victimized, isolated, and sometimes even assassinated, right? Where you become the enemy of the state for speaking out very yes. vociferously against these kinds of systems. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up, um, uh, Musoka. So we're gonna move to our third uh, round of provocations and I'm gonna ask Paul to start us off by answering this question because you are the control over care uh, guru. <laughs> um, so it has been argued that um, colonial era health authorities were actually more concerned about disease control than medical care. How do you see this control over care paradigm playing out in the COVID-19 pandemic and responses to it, particularly in areas of the globe where you research and work? Paul, please start us off. Thank you. I'm, I, I think it's kind of cool, Rob Tell, to be the control over care guru after fight, fighting that logic. And, uh, you know, what struck me, uh, you know, is, is how often that gets missed. You know, you'll even be reading about, let's say, response to African sleeping sickness or some, you know, uh, dramatic uh, epidemic. Uh, and there are detailed reports, some of these colonial reports, and uh, with no mention really of care, unless they're giving some inferior toxic kind of uh, treatment that they're kind of testing out. And that, that's another reason, as you said at the beginning, to keep going back to the scholarship, to, to you know, critical reflection on what has happened and how it's been reported. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that, uh, that the natural inclination of so many people is to resist control over care. Maybe most people, for example, how did that play itself out in Liberia during the epidemic where, you know, Masaka, Masoka and many others faced mortal peril. And in the absence of professional caregivers, and how could you have professional caregivers if there are no really functioning medical schools or, or very few nursing schools, when you don't have them, who takes care of the critically ill or injured? And it's always, again, your mom, your aunt, your grandmother, your daughter, your you know, and then who buries you in some place, it's gonna be a male relative, but it's, it's traditional healers and family members. So whenever we allow control over care to proceed unchallenged, right? Why do, and why do we not challenge it? Well, it's not cost effective, it's not sustainable, it's not prudent, it's not, you know, just a list of things that you never hear out of the mouth of someone facing these epidemics. It's from our peers in the universities and development agencies. And when you hear it happening, you know, you, you have to resist. And, say, and again, just ask the question, which I, Sumega did, I, I believe, beautifully again, uh, how would I want to be treated in this circumstance? So, uh, you know, for control over care to end, for people who are ill or injured to regard, be regarded as important as, as the rest of us, we have to have the staff stuff space and systems, which is why we, I keep going back to the materiality of all this uh, and, you know, just as asking the question, can we, can we end this uh, or can we fight coloniality? The answer is yes. We have to do it in material ways uh, in contemplating these uh, radically disparate epidemics. COVID is one of those, right? Because when we only talk about prevention and never about care, and then we start marveling at the age structure and demographic structure of the continent of Africa and why are there so few cases and you know, all kinds of questions that deserve real scrutiny, we have to keep on thinking about uh, the same kind of things that we would want, of course, care when we're ill, and prevention when it's possible, and social supports for people who lose their jobs or are furloughed or have funeral experiences. And uh, when we have 
address those uh, globally as regards COVID, we'll have a much decolonized uh, intervention, if you ask me. Thank you, Paul. I'd like to bring Mosoka in to talk about, you know, comparing the responses between COVID-19 and then e Ebola outbreaks that were um, really ravaging in, in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and then now in, in the DRC. And then to also bring in your perspective about the, Co the COVAX facility, which you've been doing a lot of advocacy around. Um, let's hear from you, Mosoka. Thank you very much. Uh, I probably want to dovetail on what uh, Paul spoke about, the issue of uh, prevention or care. Again, you got to understand that it's selfishly driven. It's not driven because they want to see us prevent it. In fact, someone told me when I sat in a meeting on the global health security agenda, that the reason why we are pumping so much money into surveillance and early warning is to prevent the disease to so that it stay in Africa and does not come to the West. And so post Ebola, we pump so much money into prevention so much money. I know this because I was part of the discussion in the global health agenda, millions of dollars. Then the World Bank came up with a DC project in West Africa, all on prevention. But what happened at the expense of care? And so there's a vicious circle. If you do not invest in care between outbreaks and the average person does not have respect and trust for the care system, they will go to the default pathway. What do we call the default? The traditional healers and the prayer group. And when they start to realize that because the hospitals don't have staff, quality staff in medicine, and they are used to traditional healers, when they get sick with a potential infectious disease, the first place to go is to the traditional healer. And when they end up there, what happens is that it gets too late by the time we get to know the disease has spread. Don't go far. The most recent case in Guinea, Ebola case in Guinea, this person end up, a nurse end up to the traditional healer. And the case was never picked up until the case died and was buried. And so once you do it, you think that you are protecting yourself, but without concurrent investment in care and prevention, all you simply are doing, you're defeating the purpose because you are leaving room for diseases that will go undetected. And by the time you pick them up, they are amplified and they are spread further. And so this one-sided lens of every investment to protect oneself and not the world is, is a big challenge. And that leads me to the issue of uh, the COVID vaccine. Right, so we, we are advocating for um, long. The first argument we took was a moral argument. You know, we said each of humanity uh, vaccine is a global good. We said to advocate that so everyone should have the vaccine because I was on the panel for the Ebola vaccine to get a vaccine to be common for everyone. COVID is not, is, and we're advocating for RP. Now we see a new risk the emergence of variant strains that are, that are having high transmissibility and they're having high uh, um, vaccine failure rate, so much that Modena and Pfizer are trying to do new tests to create new vaccines and to add a third booster. And so what I'm saying and we're advocating is that, first we took the moral argument that all humans who have access to vaccines is a global good. But now we are going much more to the human security argument. If you do not vaccinate the world, all of our risks, how many times we are going to create new vaccines because we don't invest in the care model. We don't know the real transmission in Africa. For example, the study was done in Zambia among the mortuary and showed that one in five persons who died, died from COVID, but we don't know that. And so as a result, we're having variant screen that will challenge all one security. So basically the mindset of investing only in prevention defeats the world and amplify outbreaks and diseases. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I want to put you on a bullhorn, Musoka, because I think all the pharmaceutical companies that are, you know, pushing against this intellectual property rules to ensure that countries in the so-called global south have access to the vaccines is just, I think it's unconscionable. So we need to put you on a bullhorn so those pharmaceutical companies can hear what you're saying. It's not just a moral imperative. It's, it's a security. It's a national security, an international security issue. Thank you very much. Let's bring... Let's bring Sumega yeah. into the conversation. Um, any thoughts on this particular question, Sumega? Thanks, and thanks, Paul and Musoka. For I'm going to just build up on what Paul said and Musoka said. On, but I just want to start with that I see the present situation to be to not have progressed so much from the period of the international sanitary conferences the start of international health, the start of international cooperation in health and why few countries chose to 
invest in the health of the others, still calling them the sources of infections, you know, the Asiatic diseases, the cholera coming from them, and we need to protect our trade and we need to protect our economy and therefore we will invest in their health. I don't see it has really changed much, has it? This whole focus on COVID, so much of resources going on COVID, and not just on COVID, on HIV, on polio, and in India and, and in other places, so much of aid coming in, distorting national priorities and so on. Whose health are we actually protecting? Are we protecting the health of the people in India? If you really want to please come and give some food to the Indian people. You know, people are dying of hunger. People are dying of respiratory diseases. Kids are dying of diarrhea. Whose health are you actually trying to promote? And this is not to say that aid is not effective, it's, it's not doing any good, or eradicating HIV is not important, or eradicating polio is not important. What I'm trying to get attention onto is, who is this important for? And where does that relative importance lies? And this brings me to my second point in terms of, in all this process, how have we killed I'll just take a minute uh, to finish this on the pluralistic and the traditional health systems. I just heard Masoka saying people going to traditional healers, uh, you know, and, and, and this has come largely in the global health, public health debate, but the traditional indigenous pluralistic health systems have been systematically killed by the modern medicine. And it, we should ask ourselves on why people are still going to traditional healers. Why have the modern medicine, so-called evidence-based medicine, not being able to build that trust in the people that that should be the first uh, point of entry. Why has it not been able to make itself so accessible? Why this hospital-based systems in times of COVID with hospital beds running up, people are still confined to the older strategies of isolation and quarantine. You know, these are things to reflect and ask for a, for a change in the way we approach global health and global health partnerships. Sorry for taking extra time, thanks. No, no, absolutely important points about the whole idea of indigenous knowledge systems. What are they valued and validated? And, and if not, why not, right? Um, I understand that we are running out of time, but there's a, a question by Emma Kelly, an LSE graduate that I think is very, very important. And I hope that we can take maybe 30 seconds each to respond to this. And she says, do you believe that powerful governing bodies like the big bad WHO, she didn't say big bad, I said that, like the big bad WHO are complacent with regards to colonialism or are they genuinely working towards global health equities? Are institutions, multilateral institutions like the WHO a force for good? Can we start with Mosoka and then we'll go to Paul and then we'll go to Sumega. Maybe 30 second sound bites. I'm sorry to rush you, but just, yeah. What, what, what do these institutions represent? The issue is Armstrong, by the way, it was arranged to be a very strong force. And um, 80% of the WHO funding comes from three, three institutions. So imagine a WHO way of funding is the access funding. Country with low GDP would give little money. So not everyone is equal. Even if they go to the war, general war assembly, because of the fact the way the WHO is, so whoever gives the money makes the decision. The WHO has 80% of the funding coming from three big countries of the West. So the WHO can never ever be the force. It is good, the strongest best as a collective body, but it is handicapped by just the, finan the way the financial enrichment is made, the way the secretary, the, gen the director general is elected, it must be influenced by greater power. So I could say more, but I probably want to start the way it is arranged with all its good intention for forming is hamstrung by these forces. Again, we'll come back to coloniality. Great, thank you very much, Mosoka. Paul, can we hear your thoughts on what are these institutions representing? Are they a force for good? Well, you know, I think they're so different one from the other, but just to stick with the example of the World Health Organization, if we didn't have it, we'd have to invent something like it for the reasons that Sumega brought up earlier. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, Masoka also brought it up when talking about health security. And um, so, uh, first of all, I think the answer is yes. There, there, there's a lot of promise. There's, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of the current DG of the WHO. Um, and I, and, and I, you know, can it be capable of anti-colonial rule if these structural impairments that Masoka mentioned are addressed or somehow countered? Sure. There are people in there who, who will, will be, you know, committed to that. But again, 
we should not rush to us to think we can understand the intentions of those inside the WHO, but we can understand their policies, policies, practices, and scholarship, and and the actions that they take or don't take. And I think, I think we should continue to provide critical uh, input or even oversight uh, to that organization. Thank you, Rob Tell. Sorry. No, it's great. I hope you you and Tedros are in many many conversations across <laughs> across the ocean. Sumega. So Thanks. I just want to quickly make two points. One, that it's not just WHO's business. It's everybody's business. And among all the global health actors, I personally trust WHO more than any other because of its democratic structure, because of its regional offices and so on. So if we had to give that authority to any of the other global health dominant actors today, I would put all my trust and my bets on WHO to take this agenda forward. Over. Fantastic. Hey. Global health, addressing global health inequalities, addressing the coloniality of global health is everybody's business. I think that's such a beautiful way to summarize our conversations today. I am so honored and privileged to have had Sumega, Paul, and Musoka in this conversation. It's been such a pleasure engaging in conversation with you, Sumega Ashtana, Musoka P. Fala, and Paul Farmer. Thank you so much to Mega Mosoka and Paul for finding time in your incredibly busy schedules to join us. I'd also like to publicly acknowledge and thank two people without whom this event would not be possible. Lawrence Radford of the Faroz Laji um, Center for Africa and Charnel Nunez, who is with the LSE Global Health Initiative. I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for being so gracious and patience in your responses for participating in our poll and for graciously um, welcoming our three guests. Um, I want you to please stay well, keep safe, take care of yourselves and each other until next time. Goodbye and farewell. Thank you so much.